Hello and welcome to the podcast Peace Matters, an IAP and Ponto podcast which deals with contemporary conflicts all around the globe and how to solve them. On the 27th of November 2023, the IIP organized an international conference dealing with the South Caucasus and we are going to release a series of podcasts dealing with Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, regional powers and European Union integration, possible European Union integration of Georgia. This first episode on the South Caucasus deals with possibility for peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan and I'm having two excellent experts Anna Hess, she's head of the Conflict Resolution Center at the Austrian Center for Peace, and Thomas De Waal, who is a journalist, a writer and senior fellow at Carnegie Europe. My name is Stephanie Fenkert, director of the International Institute for Peace, and I hope you enjoy this series. Thank you, Anna and Tom, for joining me today in our uh, podcast, Peace Matters. Today we are going to talk about the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan after the takeover of Nagorno-Karabakh by Baku. And I would already like to, to go into the topic with you, Anna. Uh, Anna, you have like a very, very long experience in conflict uh, uh, mediation and peace mediation. Uh, I would like to ask you, I mean, after everything what just happened recently in September 2023, do you think that there actually is a chance to come to a peace agreement, which is kind of also long lasting and more than a ceasefire agreement? I mean, what is your take on, on, on the recent events? Well, thank you, Stephanie, for having me here. Um, great to be in this conversation with you, Tom. Um, Okay, if I were to go into a yes or no question, I mean, there is always a chance for a peace agreement. The question is what kind of peace agreement, whether it's going to be a fair and a just uh, peace agreement, whether it's going to be based on compromise and acceptable solution to both parties at least, uh, and whether it's going to be durable. And, and I have my doubts about that, about the durability, about the sustainability and about the nature of the peace agreement. Um, happy to go into it uh, into detail, but that will be a short answer. Tom, same question maybe to you. I mean, after what happened just recently, how do you see the future of a possible peace agreement? We know that after the war in 2020, Azerbaijan was pushing for it quite strongly, but we do know that there are also some limitations which make it very, very difficult to get to this compromise, which Anna actually already mentioned. So what are the main obstacles? Sure, well, I mean, obviously, um, there's a historic opportunity now, just looking at it from outside, for Armenia and Azerbaijan to... I mean, I, I, I don't really like the word peace agreement. It's more of a normalization agreement um, for them to... They nev what they were never able to do, to normalize relations, to agree on borders, to open up communications. When you, you know, look at the circumstances, that should be possible. The, the Karabakh conflict was a tragedy, the way it ended in September was a tragedy with the exodus of the indigenous Armenian population from there. So there is one school of thought that, okay, um, that Karabakh is no longer this burden around Armenia's neck, that um, therefore it should be easier for the two countries to just to recognize each other within um, agreed borders and, and to move on. But unfortunately, we all know that this is not the way conflicts work. There's trauma, there's grievance. Um, and in Azerbaijan, there seems to be, um, with President Ilham Aliyev, a kind of victor mentality, that there's other things he wants from Armenia. Uh, I think he feels that he has the support of Turkey and, and of Russia here. So I think he's going to, unfortunately, try and dictate more terms to Armenia. The, 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 the essential problem in this conflict always has there, there's been a kind of asymmetry. Um, um, and now Azerbaijan really has the cards. Um, we could argue 10 years ago, Armenia had, had really a, ha, had the cards and was, could have been able to dictate uh, a, a favorable peace settlement. But now very much it's on, on Azerbaijan's terms. And uh, uh, what Tom just said, if you also would like to reflect on this one, maybe you also can give us a little bit of an impression. I mean, what happened in the last uh, 30 years, not only. I mean, we know the conflict is very, very long. It has a long history. Trauma on both sides have been mentioned. It is obviously always an obstacle also to move forward. But we know the, the war in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union, as you may say, what happened then. And then there was this 30 years of kind of trying to find a solution. I mean, from your point of view, what happened or what also went wrong, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Okay, a couple of things, right? There are a couple of points. I'm picking up on the asymmetry that Tom mentioned, absolutely. Um, and, and, and I think what I meant that it's not going to be a durable and just peace. Uh, and and it, it does stem from that as well. And when, if I were to unpack the asymmetry, Tom, is it's an asymmetry when it comes to the military advantage, military power, which is an asymmetry between Armenia and Azerbaijan when it comes to the political power. And it's an asymmetry of narrative, essentially, right? The current Armenian government has the peace narrative. Uh, I would argue without proper peace strategy behind it. Uh, the, the Azeri government is, to use your word, uh, Tom, very ambivalent, but it's very clear that they have maximalist goals and when it comes to the Armenian territory proper, right? Uh, so for me, there's that asymmetry as well, and that plays out in the negotiations and it's going to have an impact on the nature of peace agreement. Now, what went wrong? Many things went wrong, right? So I can't go back to Adam and Eve, but I think if we look at uh, asymmetry before, essentially we are functioning in an environment where the win-lose mentality is still the name of the game. You know, when in the West or, or in the North American hemisphere, we start talking about uh, oh, might is right is back into the game. I think, uh, as we all have been saying in the South Caucasus, this win-lose mentality has always been the name of the game. So, uh, yes, there was asymmetry also before. Uh, why uh, the parties failed to settle the conflict uh, in a compromised way over the 25 plus years, almost three decades. I think it's that mentality, the maximalist approach uh, to settling the conflict. It's either mine or yours, we cannot share type of approach. Uh, but I mean, if we, we were to go into the details, there, there was no shortage of uh, international efforts to actually support the parties to come up with these compromises. And there were a couple of packages on the table over the course of the time. But I would argue that uh, whether it was a bluff on the Armenian side or serious, there were still, uh, there was still an interest, right? Because they had the upper hand. They had all the cards in their hands. And, and one thing that I want to mention, and even the occupation of the seven territories around Nagorno-Karabakh, not Nagorno-Karabakh itself, but around it, it was supposed to be a bargaining chip at the table, which then they failed to use. But I think on the other side, you had really maximalist approach to going back to status quo, quo anti, which is what we have today, because if you would look at the defense expenditure and what Azerbaijan was gearing towards all of these years, uh, towards taking over militarily, that was clear that they were already getting ready to settle the issue militarily, right? So Armenia th thought they settled the issue, mili issue militarily in the early 90s, and they failed to actually consolidate it politically, this victory. Now what Azerbaijan is doing, the absolute victory, trying to consolidate this victory on the table, and actually more than the victory, essentially. So that's, that will be my take on this. Yeah. Um, we know it's actually a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. For Azerbaijan, now since September 2023, there is no conflict any longer about Nagorno-Karabakh. We took it back. It was always actually ours. I mean, that is what they are saying. And it's also true right. when it comes to international law. But the problem is, especially I would say for the European Union and, and for since we talk also about peace, is actually how they actually got it back. Oh. So that they tried, they, they used coercive means, which is a military, um, a military um, intervention. I mean, in 2020, and now again, mm -hmm. a limited military operation, which was like for one day, which led to the capitulation of um, the Armenian um, Armenians there in Karabakh. I mean, how do you see the, the, this whole field of coercive diplomacy? Would you call it coercive diplomacy at all? I, I, I think that's a good term. I've heard that term from Azerbaijanis themselves, that what they, you know, that they... They use, they've used force. Um, in, in their view, the force has been, since 2020 was obviously um, a much bigger operation, but since then they've lim used force in fairly limited operations. Clearly several hundred people have died, which, which is very serious, but it's not on the scale of, you know, Ukraine or, or Syria. Um, but they've also, and they've also asked for things at the negotiating table. So they've, they've said, okay, give us this, and if, and if you don't give us, um, give us that, we have the option of force. I think the tragedy here is that there is that a bit more time. It would have been possible, I think, to negotiate some kind of arrangement um, whereby the Karabakh Armenians could stay in their homeland. There would have been some kind of international mechanism there on the ground, some kind of international presence. Many of them would probably have left, but at least some kind of Armenian Karabakh would have stayed within Azerbaijan, um, but many factors worked against that. Um, the rush, the, the kind of, the kind of 
very duplicitous role that Russia plays, but also this maximalism that we've already been been talking about, um, the way that, you know, I see this conflict as being, people have used the terms territorial integrity, self-determination, but it's actually um, in both nations, unfortunately, there's been something really which goes back to early 20th century. It's, you know, an irredentist project um, in, in, on the Armenian side, you know, the fatal, one of one fatal mistake was to rename this territory, not Nagorno-Karabakh, but Artsakh, an Armenian name, start renaming uh, captured Azerbaijani places with Armenian names, imply that it's over for, for Azerbaijan. And that obviously fueled on the other side, this revanchist narrative, where they're also now remembering, or, you know, historical territories they, that they say belong uh, to us, so that and all this in an international context where these kind of normative ideas of self determination, ideas of you know a, a, a kind of UN OSC peacekeeping force are devalued. Um, so so unfortunately, the Western uh, leverage to kind of have a more normative solution to to these problems um, is not so great. Yeah. You were talking about also the West, and we do know that the West also, I mean, the European Union uh, has been also trying to facilitate at least to come to kind of an agreement. But it, it was not only the European Union, it was also the Russians and also the United States. I mean, you working as a mediator, I mean, how did you actually see this process, Anna? I mean, what, what did they try to do? And, and do you think that they could have done better? Or did they, where did they fail, essentially? I mean, what was maybe one of the biggest problems they were facing? I mean, it might also relate to what you said in the beginning, that there is an absolute also lack of trust between Armenia and Azerbaijan, also towards the West, and maybe also the different um, mediation formats, or, or how, how do you see, see this mediation efforts from like all those different actors? Right. Um, well, essentially, after 2020, Ru Russia was the sole mediator, I mean, mediator uh, in terms of um, high-powered diplomacy, right? So it's not your classical mediation where you bring the party. So it's Russia essentially brokered the ceasefire, right? Uh, and Russia being the co-chair of the back then uh, OSCE Minsk group that dealt with the uh, conflict over NK for uh, more than two decades. So it was Russian initiative. And then we had uh, EU and the Americans coming into the picture with their high-powered diplomacy. Um, so then I would, I would more, I would call it more third-party engagement rather than mediation as such, but let's call it high-powered mediation, which is something, a professional jargon to use that. So yeah, there were essentially then a three um, parallel processes by three key geopolitical actors with vested interest in the region, right? So then this, uh, that uh, raises a lot of questions, whether well, what are the intentions and what's the leverage they could use. In theory, if you have big powers actually mediating as third parties, they have a lot of leverage that can use to actually come to a certain breakthrough. But here we had, again, back to that asymmetry, we had a situation massively asymmetric, militarily, political, and diplomat on diplomatic level. Uh, the traumas that you mentioned, and let's not forget these are people, you know, decision makers are traumatized people, essentially, at the end of the day. So um, I cannot necessarily blame the third parties. I mean, as long as the conflict parties don't want to deal with their uh, different in a peaceful way, but here we had an asymmetric situation, essentially brokering the ceasefire and very quickly implementing um, collage, how do you say, uh, you know, a copy, not, not copy pasted, a very quickly written agreement some sort of an agreement. It's not even a ceasefire agreement, right? It's a one pager. So very quickly they started implementing it, which is an unusual thing in, in our practice, right? Now, the big challenge that I want to say, and we have talked about this many times already, is that if you have three parallel processes led by three different geopolitical actors with three different interests, the chances of the conf one of the conflict parties of using this as a forum shopping, what we say, uh, are high. And I think that's what happened when it comes to the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh. That's what happened. And uh, for Azerbaijan, this was a good chance to use the different fora to strike a deal on the side with the Russians over NK. And uh, that's what happened with all the good intentions. So uh, my point would have been, my message to the mediators would be, if you're not cooperating with each other, at least coordinate, right? Um, so, let, let me just add to that. I mean, I think the core problem, let, let's sort of look at Bosnia. I mean, 
you know, it's a, the Dayton agreement, sure, an imperfect agreement, but it was able to stabilize the situation on the ground because there was a massive security presence brought in, you know, thousands of, of, of international troops, you know, UN, NATO there on the ground. That was never available in Nagorno-Karabakh. You had a cease, up, up until 2020, you had a ceasefire line, hundreds of kilometers long with no peacekeepers on it at all. Um, and the Western mediators, you know, they came up with all these plans, but there was never a serious peacekeeping force on offer um, to put on the ground. Uh, so as one of the parties, Azerbaijan, could then immediately cross the ceasefire line, change the facts on the ground. And then the only serious power who, was, who offered peacekeepers was Russia, but it offered it on its terms. And those peacekeepers, as we saw, in just in September, suddenly, you know, melted away, stood down. So this, is, I think, is a general problem for this region, is that there's this a kind of security vacuum that no one has filled. Now, internationally, there's been no kind of security pact. No one really respects each other's borders. And the people who manipulate that are Russia and, to a certain extent, Turkey. And, you know, the multilateral actors who are trying to engage on this just don't lack that essential tool. And I think this is a, is a persistent problem that we're now seeing um, with, you know, Azerbaijani threats to Armenia as well. Yeah. Anna was mentioning before already um, those different mediators with different interests. And we do know if we talk about Armenia and uh, the South Caucasus, uh, Azerbaijan, also including obviously Georgia, it is still a post-Soviet space. So there are different interests, obviously, also from Russia. And Russia used to be, at least on paper, it used to be the security guarantor for Armenia. And then you mentioned, then you mentioned that actually after the ceasefire agreement, more or less uh, from 2020, they were able then to deploy kind of peacekeepers on Azerbaijani territory for the first time for 30 years. And I think Azerbaijan was not right. too happy about it either. So my question would be a little bit about, like all those regional actors, I mean, there is Turkey on the West. We know a very difficult relationship going back, obviously, um, to the history during the Ottoman Empire, the genocide on Armenians. So a difficult relationship for Armenia with Turkey. But there is also a difficult relationship, obviously, between Turkey and Azerbaijan. Uh, not, not Turkey and Azerbaijan, forgive me. They are actually very, very good friends, but between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but a very good relationship between, um, again, Turkey and uh, Azerbaijan. So, and then there's also Iran here on the, southern, on the southern front. So, I mean, how do you actually access this whole regional situation? Right. And maybe the question is for both of you, but if you would like to start talking. Sure, I mean, obviously, this is a region where you've got these three nation states, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and then you've got minority populations, and then... You've got the three big neighbors who are all of them former imperial powers in the region, uh, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. It, you know, Turkey and Iran going back uh, a couple of hundred years, but also former imperial powers. And they now, they've now come up with this new idea, the format of a three plus three. It's actually, in fact, a three plus two, because the Georgians don't want to be in it, where, you know, The regional powers, we can sort it out, regional solutions to regional problems, sounds nice. But again, all of these three powers have uh, an agenda. Uh, and this, there's no mention of international law, UN, Helsinki principles, none of, these, none of this. And of course, no mention of uh, EU, which is deliberately excluded from this format. You know, Turkey and Russia don't agree on much, but they do agree on keeping... Um, the West out, um, and you know, the West is imperfect, but we, but I, uh, but I think hopefully we can agree that it's a more impartial, more neutral broker than these three uh, regional powers. And I think again, this is this is this is the the big problem uh, this region faces, particularly when the three countries themselves are unable or unwilling to come up with a kind of Uh, to partner with each other, and they're constantly also looking to these uh, external powers uh, as patrons to, to, to get leverage over one another. 
maybe following up a little bit on what he said and the special relationship maybe between Armenia and Russia because Armenia now is very, very disappointed for obvious reasons with Russia since it didn't provide the security it was actually supposed to provide for them. And obviously Nagorno-Karabakh was always kind of excluded when it comes to security, but we also know that Azerbaijan also um, kind of... Um, had some military attacks on Armenia proper, and there even Russia was kind of silent. So Armenia then, now what we saw, I mean, they did not participate in the last CSTO meeting, so they are discussing if they might even drop out of it. And they also uh, wanted to sign, and I think it's already in the parliament for ratification, the Rome Statute. So, I mean, these are all like very difficult steps for Armenia, considering the whole difficult geopolitical situation they are in there. So there is no other security provider for Armenia, uh, if you look at it from, from, from now. So, I mean, what is... From your point of view, what is Armenian's strategy? I mean, Pashinyan becoming more kind of a democratic figure, but, but, but what is his strategy in this context? I mean, how does he see for Armenia to get out of this kind of difficult situation? Do you, do you see anything like that at all? <laughs> Stephanie, too many questions. Okay, yeah. uh, right. I mean, that, that's... Uh, I was hoping you would never ask me that because of all the people I cannot talk about Pashinyan strategy because I don't see any strategy. That would be my very short answer. And, and that's an unfortunate thing to say because a country in this situation at the constellation of these complicated geopolitical uh, sort of factors, like at the heart of this uh, constellation, cannot afford not to have a strategy. Uh, neither war strategy or peace strategy. So that would be my very short and blunt answer. Um, but but ha having said that, it's a very difficult situation, right? So in regionally and internationally, we are more... Uh, the tendency is going more into this campism, polarization, right? You're either with the West or you're, you're either with the East. Increasingly, this divide is becoming stronger, right? You're either with Ukraine or you're with, with Russia. There is no nuanced space anymore. And that, that reflects also here. So Armenia increasingly has to make choices. Okay, am I with the West or am I with the East? Who am I with? I'm physically here in the middle of, you know, all of this Eurasian, so let's say it, powers. But my heart is beating for the West and in, in the U.S somewhere or in, in the European capitals, but my strategic interests are here. So it's a difficult situation, having said what I said about the current government. Um, and and uh, my impression is that the current government is actually desperate and confused to look for any uh, security umbrella because they themselves are unable to, to provide for their own security. Have, they have outsourced essentially their security for years and not only this government, to the, to the Russians. Now you said about uh, uh, Armenians being disappointed in the Russians. For for all good reasons, uh, but I think what I hear from Russian colleagues, it's the other way is also true, right? The Russians are extremely disappointed in the current Armenian government, so we can go into this forever. But the, the, the challenge is not only Russia, obviously. One thing that we should, we should keep in mind that these are countries where personalities matter tremendously. Institutions are not there as strong. So for the Russians, personality of the Armenian you know, government and, and for the Armenians the, and personal connections matter a lot. And to my understanding, this is lacking already you know, since 2018 at least. So there is no love lost there and, and the disappointment is clearly going both sides. But there's also the very important thing, it, it's in a very rocky place, right? So uh, uh, you know, goes west because that is going to guarantee probably his own political survival as well. I don't know. But on the other hand, when you see on the ground yesterday, I was talking to people and they were saying very, very primitive down to earth issue, but extremely important to see how livelihoods are impacted by these small decisions or big decisions with consequences is that, you know, the trucks trying to go to Russia, you know, between Armenia and Russia through Georgia, they're, they're stuck, right? Because the Russians are just blocking it because Pashinyan said, I'm not going to go to the CSTO. So it's very mercurious, not thought through. If you, have a, you, know, if you want to diversify your allies, you should do that, but with proper strategy, right? And we know the Ar Armenia's dependence on Russia when it comes to military, when it comes to energy security, when it comes to you know, the diaspora, sending remittances, the Gastarbeiter stuff. So it's endless. Uh, but I wanted to talk about Iran as well, right? Because it's not only Russia that is nervous about Armenia's sort of mercurious efforts or flirting with the West, but also Iran is uh, worried about that, right? So on the one hand, Iran would be supporting Armenia's territorial integrity, forgive me, and they have said it openly. But on the other hand, Iran is very worried that Armenia is bringing West to its borders, right? 
So it's, it's very complicated and uh, fascinating, but also disturbing dynamics. If we go back a little bit on also what you mentioned, you know, the, the importance also of transport, of so-called connectivity, and then we know that Armenia kind of is isolated very much. I mean, there's this um, um, exclave, Nakichevan, right. which, uh, belongs, which is, um, belongs to, to Azerbaijan, and in this um, peace agreement, which has been on the table, I mean, it is one of the, the, the things to discuss right. is the so-called Sangesur right. corridor. Maybe you can reflect a little bit on that sure. one. Sure. I mean, yeah. this is one of the frustrating things here is is that there should be a shared interest you know um, this conflict um, everything was in the Soviet Union there was very little external trade beyond its borders then as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed all these in, um, railways and road connections were broken you know this should be the strength of this region that it's a international hub north south east west so logically you should rebuild the railways everyone should be interconnected uh, you know, and trade should re help rebuild trust. And, and, you know, and then also Azerbaijan should be reconnected to its exclave of Nakhchivan across Armenian territory. There's a, uh, a railway that hasn't operated since 1990. It's all very logical. Unfortunately, this, these, this connectivity agenda has been hijacked, weaponized, um, and, you know, the Azerbaijanis saying that they want... Um, uh, you know, as little Armenian control of this corridor as possible. The Russians saying um, that they want border guards, Russian border guards guarding it. And so, you know, and, and um, but I think, you know, what the goal should be would be to, and obviously we need a map here, but, you know, um, a, a corridor which goes through Azerbaijan across southern Armenia into this exclave of Nakhchivan, back into Armenia, and then you reopen the Armenia-Turkey border, and then suddenly this railway is an international railway where everyone is interconnected um, and Iran is also in there, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Iran and this also helps Armenia, its border opens to the west, it's not so reliant on Russia. This should be, this should be the goal um, but unfortunately everyone's narrow agenda, well I think in particular Azerbaijan's and, and, and Russia's narrow agenda is, is blocking this and, and you know there is a, a fear that that coercion will be used for Armenia, this connection to be built without Armenian proper control of it. I mean, for me now, I don't know how how you see it, Anna, but for me, I mean, if I would be Armenian and if I would have like this uh, connection through my territory, I would also like to have most probably control over course, it. Yeah. So, so in my point of view, that's a very logic um, thing actually to ask for, that it isn't um, kind of um, excluded like to foreign powers or whatever. I mean, this is one of the problems, but there is this other very concerning notion also about these other um, so-called exclaves, enclaves in the north, you know, which kind of uh, Azerbaijan also kind of says they, they, they still belong to us. I mean, Nagorno-Karabakh, it's done. I mean, we got it back. But, you know, like, still there is this kind of um, small towns uh, in the northern part of Armenia, which are very essential for Armenia proper as well, because it actually is part of the route to the north as well. So, so how do you see the situation there? And do you think that this could be a point of a new escalation? And, and how can we actually prevent this from happening? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, we have been using the word coercion a number of times, and I, I think that is still sort of the major approach in settling the issues. Um, okay, I, I want to pick up on one point when you, uh, you, you know, you have been, you kept saying NK is over, Nagorno-Karabakh is over, then let's just move on. Um, for the Azeri government, clearly that's the case. For the current Armenian government, that's the case. I'm not sure that's the case for many Karabakhis who have lost their homes and, and left I don't know, cultural heritage of thousands of years there. So uh, let's, not, let's not generalize that. Um, but if I come back to the enclaves, what you call, these are essentially, to my knowledge, and that's a limited knowledge, yeah? I mean, anything we talk about when it comes to the sort of uh, negotiation uh, topics, are, are our info is limited. It's not quite open, it's just media-based. Uh, it's eight villages that were passed on to Soviet Azerbaijan by Soviet governments, right? So, but, but because, you know, we should remind uh, ourselves and our listeners, actually, that because now Azerbaijan is on this victorious horse, so to speak, and they see that coercion pays off. The higher the coercion, the more the compromises on the Armenian side, they think we might as well, right, take this. These were villages that were populated by Azeris, ethnic Azeris, 
citizens of Soviet Union, citizens of Soviet Armenia, right? But now, because there is this massive asymmetry, I think for Azerbaijan, this is the chance. They saw that they can take NK, they could actually kick people out, forcefully displace them. They could, in, you know, make incursions into Armenia proper. Why not ask for these territories? Not because they want to have necessarily Azer ethnic Azeris back, but these are strategic locations that would actually rip Armenia apart, left and right, or north and south, right? So these are strategic locations. So it, this is not an irrational wish, because for the Azerbaijani side, they, they want to make reference to these Soviet arrangements, and the maps are not agreed upon. I mean, we, which maps, right? 1926, 1930 something, and 1975. And of course, when you are the strong in strongest position, you're going to impose the, the map that is the most favorable for you. And that's what's happening right now. And yes, there is the fear of uh, taking over these enclaves, these villages by force. And, and I just wanted to say one thing that is important. I think we had this conversation also yesterday. Uh, if the goal for the Azerbaijani government were to, okay, our people are from these villages, they want to go back to these villages. I think the current Armenian government, at least, would greet them openly, like with a warm heart, and say, okay, you were in these villages, come and live in these villages, but under the Armenian jurisdiction, be Armenian citizens, right? But uh, that's not the goal. Mm -hmm. Maybe in order, uh, if we think now a little bit also about the European Union, and we know that Armenia, Azerbaijan, I mean, both of them are essentially partners in the so-called Eastern Partnership of the European Union, because the European Union considers them kind of its neighborhood, and, and they think that security implications, what happens there, does also, you know, like reflect security in Europe. And then on the other hand, I mean, the European Union does also have kind of not too bad relations, let's call it like that, with Azerbaijan, due to obvious reasons, which is like oil and gas. I mean, there is also this economic, um, um, situation. And on the other hand, I mean, um, Azerbaijan now being very confident um, with um, the victory, I mean, we can call it like that because that's what happened militarily. I mean, it was not about winning the hearts of Armenians, but being very confident, but it might be also a possibility for the European Union, you know, that Azerbaijan doesn't want to be portrayed as like an always evil state or whatever. So maybe can the European Union like use kind of its leverage on that, that this is, does not happen. So, you know, to, to, to kind of stop Azerbaijan from, from going militarily even further to, to these exclaves or enclaves or however you name it. I mean, do you see a possibility there? You know, I, th I think um, there is a certain deterrence possibility from the European Union, possibly stronger from the United States, which doesn't have this problem of 27 countries, you know, reaching a consensus, Azerbaijan has. I think there's a divide in the European Union on Azerbaijan, so, you know, countries like, like France and some of the northern European countries, you know, don't see much, don't see Azerbaijan as a partner, and they would prefer to, you know, really concentrate on, on supporting democratic Armenia, whereas, you know, Hungary, uh, supports Azerbaijan, Italy, uh, and Bulgaria get gas from from Azerbaijan. Four or five EU countries, you know, have have been getting their gas supplies recently. Uh, a lot of them from Azerbaijan. So I think there's a divide there. I, I think, you know, I think Azerbaijan treads carefully. It's salami tactics, that, that, um, which you know give us a little time for the EU to respond. Um, but unfortunately, the EU has been very reactive. And I think EU and also US need a more proactive strategy for Azerbaijan, um, for the region as a whole, and be less reactive to sort of, you know, send a clearer message to Azerbaijan, which didn't work in the case of Karabakh about if you do this, that we will come down very hard on you. And also a clearer message to Armenia, we will support you, but, you know, don't harbor too many illusions because we, we cannot replace Russia as a security provider. So I think there needs to be a, uh, a more proactive strategy generally. Uh, and for me, again, uh, a missing piece in this is, is Armenia-Turkey normalization. It's very frustrating. Uh, Turkey for years promised it would normalize relations, open the border if Armenians withdrew from these occupied territories. Then that changed again in 2020. And, um, you know, President Erdogan is still holding out on, on that normalization, but I think more work can be done to prepare for that normalization to, you know, say to Turkey, sure, we, we understand you have issues with Azerbaijan, but we really want to support this as part of a more general strategic uh, picture of kind of opening up the region. 
since uh, we're already getting to the, to the end of the podcast, I would still like to go back on the, on, the, on the title of the podcast, which is Peace Matters. And I do think, I mean, does peace matter? Anna, I mean, what do you think? I mean, does it matter for the European Union? And maybe you can also, why does peace matter? And what about the people? I mean, we didn't talk too much about Armenians and, and also Azeris. We, we, we touched upon the trauma and whatever, but peace matters essentially for people living there. So, so what would be your take on, on peace matters in general in this whole complex situation, which we, we, we tried a little bit to unwrap, but obviously there is still a lot more to discover. <laughs> well, um, peace matters every day, all the time, um, for all times. Depends who's peace, how do we define peace, what is peace? For me, peace is, um, is, is being free from fear, right? Um, uh, for me, uh, peace is visiting my mother's grave without having the fear that I might be shot by the you know, soldiers standing, um, I don't know, a kilometer and a half, sorry for becoming personal. For somebody else, peace is having a pasture for their cows to graze, right? Um, we have had a beautiful project of peace in Europe for 70 years. Unfortunately, that has been challenged, that is groaning. So peace matters, every effort matters, but covering um, initiatives that are essentially consolidating military, military victories, for me, is not peace. That's, not, that's a recipe for actually more war, right? So we are back, unfortunately, in these times where war matters all the time. It's easier to make, relatively easier. Uh, there's more money for making war than peace. There's more science for making war than peace. So um, I, I, would, I, I would say, yes, peace matters, but that's a different, uh, it's a matter of definition, it's a matter of context, it, it's a matter of the just peace at the end of the day, right? And sustainability, because uh, for the Armenian side, actually, when you think about it, or for anyone, not Armenian side, any asymmetric uh, party, any weak party in negotiations, in peace work, uh, you know, just uh, giving in to more forceful coercion, you know, compromise, that's not peace, that's helplessness. So uh, that's a different conversation. Uh, people to people, um, you know, I don't know what I should say. There have been for decades, there have been conversations, at least with not people to people necessarily, but between bubbles of civil society within Armenia and within Azerbaijan. I think that's still going on. Sadly, it does not necessarily translate either into policy or the larger constituencies in both countries. Uh, and obviously in Azerbaijan more than in Armenia, because in Azerbaijan you have more Armenophobia, I would argue, than in Armenia you have Azerophobia. But that might change because there is a new generation that is, there is a generation that is very complacent now and they're saying, okay, we're done with this, let's make peace. But there is a new generation that is unhappy with it and God knows how that's gonna develop. Same question to you, Tom. Peace matters. Of course, of course, peace matters. And you know, um, I think the frustrating thing here is that, you know, for through their long history, Armenians and Azerbaijanis have had long periods of coexistence. Uh, of they have many cultural things in common. Um, you know, they often sing the same songs with with different words in each language attached to them. You see in Georgia, Armenian and Azerbaijani small traders still trading with one another in Georgian markets. So I think there is a potential there, but it's just about, um, unfortunately, the message from the top, particularly from, from the top in Baku, is you know, th that we don't want to, to see this kind of coexistence, or we want to see it on, on, on our terms. And um, you know, I think there is that vision out there um, of a peaceful, coexistence. Um, but, you know, I think the essential um, you know, precondition for that is a more democratic culture in the South Caucasus, and that's unfortunately lacking. Thank you very much, uh, Anna and Tom, for your very comprehensive and also very honest and realistic, uh, I would say, take on, on what is happening right now and also the future outlook. I still think it's important to have this vision for peace at one point, because if we don't have a vision, I mean, we are not trying to get there, but we do understand that it's a very, very long process and that there very unfortunately isn't a shortcut to peace, to just peace, as you also mentioned it. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks and to our audience, um, thanks for 
Listening to Peace Matters, uh, if you like this episode or the other episodes, you can find them on YouTube, uh, the video podcast, on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. Thank you.